You have an angry young man or angry younger man. This is Job's third friend that is going to speak. You know, everybody had their first speech already. Yeah, everybody had their first speech note. So the outline that I have is based on your outline there um, and the titles of each page and things that, that I use that to create the outline here that I'm going to speak from. So hopefully you have read that, those chapters. Of course, we're not going to get through all four chapters tonight, but we will start it tonight and then probably finish it up next week with an angry younger man. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Once again, for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for these who are here tonight to study your word as we push forward in understanding the book of Job. And Heavenly Father, open up our spiritual understanding tonight that we may place it in our hearts that we may not sin against you. And that your word will make a mark upon us that cannot be erased. Bless those who are here. Bless those who wanted to be here but just could not make it. In Jesus' name, amen. An angry younger man. So we've seen two of Job's friends speak, and that is uh, first friend Eliaphaz. He spoke, Job replied. Then we uh, heard from his second friend, Bildad. Bildad spoke, and Job replied. Now, tonight, chapter 11, we get to his third friend. It's only three friends. And uh, they are, just that you know, they're older than Job. These are older friends of his, older friends. This is the third one. His name is Zophar, Zophar. So Zophar is going to talk to us tonight in chapter 11. Job is going to answer him in chapter 12, 13, and 14, because Zophar is going to make three accusations against Job, and that's in your book. He's going to say this about Job. He's going to tell Job, Job, you're guilty of sin. Job, you are ignorant of God. And Job, you're stubborn. And you are refusing to repent. So these are three accusations that Zophar is going to make against Job. And Job is going to take chapter three chapters to answer each one of those accusations. So we're going to see Zophar talk about all three in chapter 11. But you're going to see Job break down each accusation in chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. And as I said, we, we, we won't get through all of this. I just want to show you where we're going in these four chapters because they deal with Zophar and Job. So let's see. Uh, going to Job chapter 11, Zophar making these accusations against Job. Job chapter 11. Now, you know, I, I, I'm not going to read it from the New King James Version. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Uh, NLT, they call it. The NLT translation of the Bible. Because remember the way Job is reading, almost like a poetic type of reading. I want you to get a, really an understanding of what's saying. And the New, the NLT, if you don't have different versions of the Bible, please get some. Uh, I'm not telling you to put down the King James Version or the New King James Version, but uh, get some paraphrased Bibles, get some different translations so you can compare translations. Uh, also, we're going to do some scripture searching, so be prepared to turn to some scriptures uh, tonight as well. So Zophar, here's Zophar's first speech. And Zophar was very unhappy with the words of Job. So, so far, Zophar sat and listened to uh, Bildad, he listened to Eliaphaz uh, make these accusations against Job. Uh, but Zophar is not going to do anything better. He's not going to do any better. He's going to really attack Job. How is it, isn't it something that people will attack somebody when they're down, when they're sick? Now, you, don't forget, Job is sick. Job has boils all over his body. Job is in the worst place physically. If somebody come to come to come to his house and tell him, okay, the reason you like this is because you you a sinner. Have no sympathy, no sympathy whatsoever to Job. So watch this. So Job's explanation in Job chapter ten, we already read that. His explanation in Job chapter ten suggested that God may be cruel. We heard Job say that. 
Zophar wanted to remind Job that in fact God is kind. We're going to read that in a minute. Zophar was not sure that Job was a good man. You're going to hear him make a statement like that. So Zophar encouraged Job to stop his evil behavior. So let's look at it. First four verses of Job chapter 11. Zophar is speaking. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it reads as follows. Then Zophar, the Naamanite, replied to Job, Shouldn't someone answer this torrent of words? Is a person proved innocent just by a lot of talking? Should I remain silent while you babble on? When you mock God, shouldn't someone make you ashamed? You claim my beliefs are pure and I am clean in the sight of God. So right off the bat, Zophar, in the first four verses, he attacks Job's words of what he said to Bildad. And not only those words, but he attacked all of his words that Job has ever replied to this other friend too. So uh, Zophar's words seem angry. Zophar's speech was uh, Job's speech upset Zophar. Eliphaz wanted to encourage Job, we thought, in chapter 4, right? Bildad wanted to correct Job in chapter 8, but Zophar thinks he's warning Job. So you're going to get that out of this. He, he thinks he's warning Job. And that was the first four verses. So he, first four verses, he said, you're guilty. You are guilty of sin. You are nothing more than hot air. You just blabbing at the mouth all the things that Job has said so far. And Zophar has had enough. Now, just so that you know, Zophar is the, the youngest of them all. He's younger than Bildad. He's younger than uh, Eliaphaz. And he may be younger than Job. Uh, but the other two are older than Job. So the chapter in your book is called An Angry Younger Man. We don't know how young Zophar is, but he is the youngest, just to, to, just to let you know. So now we go to section number two, verse five through 12. Zophar now is going to say, Job is ignorant of God. He already accused him of being guilty of sin. So verse five through 12, he's going to say, Job is ignorant of God. You don't know God like we know God. Do y'all you, do you know any people like that? I don't know God. You don't know God like I know God. <laughs> Okay, here is verse 5 through 12 from the NLT. If only God would speak, Zophar is talking. If only God would speak, if only he would tell you what he thinks. If only he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom is not a simple matter. Listen, God is doubtless punishing you far less than you deserve. You see what he said? He thought, this man is sick. He's this man on his deathbed. He don't know if Job going to die in five minutes or in five hours, but he just told him, listen, you get what you deserve. Could you, anybody ever did that? Anybody, everybody told, told somebody off while they were dying? People have done it. Don't say they haven't done it. When somebody is down, when they're sick, and that's your opportunity to really tell them what you really think, that's what Zophar is doing. That's wrong. This is a wrong attitude. We can't do that. The scripture says, when people are down, when people are sick, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to comfort them. I don't care, do you, I don't care if you think it's your opportunity to tell them off. No, it's your opportunity to show God's kindness to them. Zophar thought, no, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to give him a thing or two. He told him, verse 6, if only... God will tell you the secrets of wisdom, telling Job that he doesn't know God. He doesn't know the wisdom of God. He knows nothing about God. And as a matter of fact, Job, you're getting what you deserve. As a matter of fact, God has been good to you. He could have did worse to you. This is what Zophar is telling him. So, so Job is saying nothing yet. Remember, Job and I will talk, start talking until chapter 12. Chapter 12, 13, and 14. He's going to answer all of these things that Zophar is saying. So my question is, once again, this is the third friend that now confronts Job, and they all think the same thing, and it's this thought. The reason Job is sick is because he did something wrong. They all said that. Is that idea still going throughout the world today? Do people still believe that? That if I can look at your problems and say, the reason you're going through problems is because 
of something you've done wrong. I think yes. we, we do it to ourselves too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something happens, you know, we say, oh man. Oh, it's because I did this and such and such. It's not necessarily something. Not necessarily something. Now, we do we do know that our actions, you know, there are consequences to our actions. But we already, we already, we already marked those off. Right? Yes, sir. For a so, so you mean to tell me that because Archie is sick, okay. he destroyed the choice. So that's why he's sick? Who's that? Our, all oh, right, some people will say that. Some people will say that. Some people will say that. You know, they would look at the, uh, somebody's sickness. If they didn't like the person when they were in the office, and that's why, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. that's why you get in now. Because when he was in office, he was, uh, he was a trick. They do it, people say it. It could be a mayor, it could be a president, it could be anybody. It, it, it could be anybody in any position or even a family member. And you're, both of you are right that people are still have this idea today that they look at your situation and they judge you based on what you are currently going through or if you are in a financial situation where you don't have a lot of finances or your car broke down or uh, something happened to you where, see, you should have been doing that anyway because God just get you back for what you did. The, the first thing we jump to is that God is attacking them. Why don't the first thing we jump to is Satan is attacking them? The first thing we do, we, we say God is doing it. Now you do have groups out there that do say you got the other extreme where a group will say it's Satan and everything is Satan. You know, everything is saying, that's the devil, that's the devil. But you got to put it in, in, in proper context. you got to answer some questions first when you're going through trials and tribulation. Is this a result? Is my debt a result of my poor decision making and finances? Yeah, it could be. <laughs> right. I, we didn't tell you to get all those credit cards, though. No, we did not. And we didn't tell you to max them all out. So you can't blame the devil for that. Okay, blame the devil. Could you blame the devil for uh, uh, for your lust? Could you blame the devil for your overeating? Could you blame the no? You can't do that. That's there's decision that we have to make, right? And there are some consequences for our decision. But there, the decisions that are out of our control now. Yeah, now you gotta you can question. You know the car accidents that you were in. You can question those car accidents. You can question uh, certain sicknesses or any sickness. You can question them because these sicknesses are out of your control unless you did something to contribute to a particular sickness. But I'm talking about sicknesses that, that are beyond your control, sicknesses that you may were born with, right? You know, what's the African-American sickness that they say we have? Uh, sickle cell. Sickle cell is very accessible to African-Americans more than other people. Why is that? So God decided, I'm going to just put sickle cell on black people. Yeah, I'm just going to let black people. Or is it the devil? So we already know sickness don't come from God. We already know that. We already know sickness is evil. So evidently, God allowed him to use sickness because Job is sick. So how come we can't look at our sicknesses as an attack from the devil? Because surely here we're about to read this man here so far, he didn't think that way. No, Joe, you sick because something you did. You lost your family because of something you did. You lost all your money because of something you did. And yes, we gotta make those checks off. And if it's not us, then it's the devil. And we got to really start talking about that. So watch what he says. He says that God is punishing you in verse uh, six. God is punishing you, and he's punishing you because you deserve it. That's what he's telling him. So far, our explanation shows his doubt. He doubts that Job's character was good. So once again, if he's saying that, uh, Job, you're suffering because of something you did, so he's saying that Job didn't have a good character. And we read in Job chapter 1 that Job was an upright man. Job had good character. Zophar said that he was wise enough to understand a secret about God, but Job wasn't wise enough. Job, you don't know the secrets of God. And let's talk about that. What, is the, what are the secrets of God? What is it that Sister Bell knows that I don't know about God? Now, it could be she may know some things because of her studying the word of God or passing scriptures that I may not know, but why are we calling it a secret? That's not something secret that only God gave her. 
and that that he only gave Sister Bill the revelation of such and such and such and such. But you do have people that teach that as well. You know, uh, some church said that the only pastors know who's really saved or not in their church and their congregation. Is that true? So God reveals to just the pastors who the real believers are. So I guess God showed the pastor the book of life, I guess. He gave the pastor the book. Okay, I want you to go to your congregation, Reverend, and go ahead and look <laughs> and see who's there. Is it the last book of life? I'll make some checks now. No, God's not doing that. So the pastor don't get no secrets from God. No. The pastor don't have a, a deeper connection to God than the members do. Does the pastor have a better connection? No, he doesn't. But we, we try to make it seem like he does, right? And that's not true. Your connection is just as strong as my connection. Because guess how close God is? He's just a prayer away. Did you know that? He is as close to you as your lips are to you. That's how close he is. And all we got to do is call out and talk to him, and he will answer. But if you didn't know that, then you will be some, in, in some group that will say, yeah, uh, the, only God gives secrets to certain people in, in the congregation. So when they prophesy to you, or when they tell you, thus saith the Lord, you're thinking that they're deeper in their relationship with God than you can be. And you wonder, God, why didn't you give me that kind of different, deep revelation? And it's not that way. That's not the way it should be looked at as in the first place. So he's wrong. Zophar is wrong in telling Job that he has these secrets of God. And Job, you don't know God because you don't know the deep secrets of God. That's wrong. So this seems strange. This seems like a strange statement because Job was suffering so much. Zophar explained that Job deserved punishment for evil because he says, God is really being good to you, uh, Job. He could have killed you. That's what Zophar said. He could have just killed you, Job. God is being good by letting you suffer like this. He put this sickness on you so you can suffer for the sins that you have committed. And we already know that's not true. We're going to go a little further. Go to verse 7 through 11. Watch this. Verse 7 through 11. The punishment would be much worse if God punished Job for every evil deed, right? If God really punished us for every evil deed now that we've done, we probably would never go to work. <laughs> we probably never get out of bed. If we really was getting, if we really got what God got, got what we were supposed to get for our sins, yeah, we, we wouldn't even be standing if God really did that. So Zophar was wrong in that area. Job comes to him, he's going to tell him in chapter 12. Watch verse 7 through 11. He's still talking. Zophar is still talking. Can you solve the mysteries of God, Job? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. And who are you? It is, it is deeper than the underworld. What do you know? It is broader than the earth and wider than the sea. If God comes and puts a person in prison or calls the courts to order, who can stop him? For he knows those who are false and he takes note of all their sins. You know, the first two verses, those first two verses, 7 and 11, they sound like a couple of different verses. Somebody turn to Job uh, 38 real quick. Go to Job 38. And somebody read verse 4 and 5 because verse 7 and 8 sounds like Job 38, 4 and 5. So somebody turn to you. Job, go back to the end of Job. Chapter 38 and read verse 4 and 5 for us. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just say, uh, when was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Mm -hmm. Declare if thou hast understanding. Who has who hath laid the the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stressed stressed the lines on, upon it? Okay, watch, this. that was uh, 38. Now that's God talking to Job. Now watch so far say the same thing to Job in verse, uh, I said 7 and 8. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of, of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do deeper than Sheol? What can you know? 
this measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. In other words, he's trying to say the same thing. Where were you, Job? Can you, can you, God says it from a positive point of view in chapter 38. Zophar says it from a negative point of view that Job can't understand God. And God is saying, from a positive point of view, who are you to question me because I'm the one that's going to bless you anyway. So it's basically the same thing that he's saying there in chapter 38, also in chapter 38, verse 19. But you don't have to read that. Just write that down. God said these things to teach Job about God's greatness. One thing we need to say all the time and talk about more, we need to talk about God's greatness. Uh, chapter 12, we're going to get to it next, but all of chapter 12 of Job, Job is going to talk about God's greatness. Here is Zophar accusing Job of not knowing God's greatness, but Zophar uh, is going to be, he's far, far from it. Zophar was saying God is very great and that's why he's doing these things to you. So Job, you are suffering because you are, here he is, He's going to say it. He's saying this. Job, you're suffering because you're an evil man. That's why you're suffering. This is what Zophar is really trying to say. You have no right to speak to God. That's what he's trying to say. And people do that today. We, we think that uh, only certain people have a right to speak to God. Only certain people have a right to do certain things. And that's not true. God is the one who is allowing us to do what we do. He is the one that's given us the faith. Yeah, he says, in other words, you do not deserve to ask God anything, Job. You're suffering because you are a sinner. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says this, an empty-headed person won't become wise <laughs> any more than a wild donkey can bear a human child. So in other words, he says, uh, telling Zophar, Zophar is trying to say this, uh, Job, you don't know God's word. You're just like an empty-headed empty person. You don't know God. You don't know him. And of course, he is wrong. And then he concludes chapter 11 with uh, making an accusation against Job, saying that Job is stubborn and he is refusing to repent. That's verse 13 through 20. Verse 13 through 20. Let's start with just verse 13 and 14 from the New Living Translation. So he makes this accusation that Job is stubborn and he's refusing to repent. If only you would prepare your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer, get rid of your sins and leave all iniquity behind. Oh, yeah, so uh, once again, uh, here's Zophar making the acquisition, get rid of your sins. If you, if you do this, and I just want to bring this part out too, the statements that Zophar is making are right, but the person he's directing his statements to are wrong. So what statements are right? He says this, if only you would prepare your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer, lift up to God in prayer, Get rid of your sins and leave all iniquity behind you. Is that a true statement? Is that how you can get rid of sin? That lift up your hearts in prayer? Yes, that's a true statement. That's true. Lift up your hearts in prayer. Pray and ask God to remove. If you are living in sin and you recognize the sin that's in your life, you are supposed to lift up your your hands in prayer and say, God, forgive me of my sins. That is a true statement. But he attributed that statement to Job. That's where he was wrong. Because Job had not sinned, right? Job did not make a mistake. Job was not in trouble. He, Zophar is telling Job to repent, repent, repent. And he said, well, that may be a true statement, but that don't apply to me. Because I'm doing what God has called me to do. Have you ever been accused of doing something wrong that you know you did not do, but no matter what you say, people have already accused you of it. And they are, and you can't seem to really make your name uh, great again <laughs> or make people to respect your name because uh, they think that you have done something wrong. He says here, oh no, wait a minute, Job was well known for his good character, right? In Job chapter 29, verse 11 and 12. So Zophar thought that Job was evil was wrong. 
is totally wrong. Jesus also taught that God sees our private behavior. So once that's found in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, we're not telling you that people get away with their sins. No, we're not saying that because God sees everything. We're saying that Job, and for this particular accusation that this man and his friends are making, they're wrong. They are making wrong accusations. He had not did, he had he hadn't done anything to cause him to be in the situation that he was in. So you all know this, that he was being what? Attacked. All of this is happening to Job because of his attack. Now we gotta remember, we probably gonna say this over and over and over again until you get it, until you say it, that Job is sick because he's being attacked by the devil. Right? And even, even, you know, even when you talk about death and when you talk about somebody, you go to the hospital and you visit somebody and you might tell them, yeah, uh, you're sick and the devil is attacking you. I'm going to lay hands on you to tell the devil to get his hands off you and you're not going to be sick. And the next day they die. That has happened, right? People pray to them, we're going to call the demon off from you. We're going to cast the demon out and the person is gone. So evidently you don't have all the power to get, you don't even know what's happening behind the scenes. It's better to say this when you go visit somebody uh, and, and let them realize that they may be attacked by the devil. You may realize it too, but you still gotta say, Lord, let your will be done. Even when you're visiting somebody that's sick, they could be attacked by the devil. That sickness uh, could come from Satan and remember, Satan wanted to kill him. God said, you can touch his body, but you can't take it. You cannot kill him. So even the devil, God has to get, the devil has to get permission from God to even, when God says time to go, it's time to go. So we have to remember that as well. So when we're visiting somebody or seeing somebody in trials and tribulation and sickness, we need to keep saying, Lord, let your will be done. And you got to show that person some comfort. That's what you should, no matter what the problem is, no matter what the situation is, where is your sympathy while they're going through? Because see, while they're going through, you don't know, your time may come when you're going through. And you want somebody to have that sympathy and have that respect and have that, that just be there for you type of person when you're actually going through. That's exactly what they're looking for. And that's what Job was looking for. Now notice, let's go back. Bildad, Eliaphaz, and Zophar, none of them gave him, gave him good advice. This man is scraping his body while they're talking. That's how sick he was. Lost, he couldn't even eat, lost all his weight, got ashes all over his body, and they're giving him bad advice while he's down? That's bad. That's bad. This is something we cannot do as Christians. Look at verse 15. He says this, I think he asked him to pray and ask God to forgive him. Then your face, this is so far still talking, then your face will brighten with innocence. You will be strong and free of fear. He said, if you actually do this, Job, if you repent of your sins, then God is going to make you better. Isn't that what Satan wanted Job to do in the first place? Listen, God, the only reason Job is serving you, he does, does Job serve you for naught? The only reason he's serving you is because he has his health and his wealth. You take that away from him, he will curse you to your face and die. So here's Zophar, here's Satan using him, watch this, to get Job to say what, what Satan wanted him to say, Lord, I'll, re I'll repent of anything, just give me my health back. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what he wanted him to say, just give me my wealth back. Lord, whatever. But Job never did it. Job never said that. He never repented of anything. He never had to say, Lord, uh, give me this back and I'll do this. He never bargained with God. A lot of people do today. You know, when they sick, when they die, Lord, if you just get me out of this one, I'll go to church three times a week. <laughs> Lord, if you just help me just this one more time. And then next year, you know, they yeah, come three times a week the first week. After that, <laughs> after that, it's back to usual. Everything's back to, back to normal. I would just go to church on Christmas and Mother's Day and Easter. 
<laughs> just, if, if I make it to Easter Sunday, I'll do that. But yeah, people do that. They, they try to bargain, bargain with God on why they're going through what they're going through. So Zophar words uh, try to be clever to get Job and trick him up to actually admit to doing something that he had not done. And you know, sometimes we do that too. Sometimes Satan get to us uh, so bad that we actually start praying and asking God to deliver us from something that we may not need deliverance from. Because we just want some relief. We just want, what, what is it? Why, why, why is it that I'm going through this? So Lord, whatever it is, I, I just, I admit to it. Lord, just help me. Just give me my money back. Just give me my job. No, you shouldn't pray like that. You should pray like Job. You know what Job said? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now what kind of faith is that? That while he was sick, he trusted God. He didn't throw up any accusations. He didn't say, God, if you do this, then I'll be, I'll be a better Christian. No, he didn't do that. He just said, though he slay me, yeah, well, I trust him. Meaning this, he looked at his sickness not as uh, something that he can fix himself. He looked at his sickness, well, if God is allowing this to happen to me, I guess evidently he could take me out of here. Then I don't know why I'm going through this. And he had a right to say why he was going through it. But he never used his sickness to say, God, I want to bargain with you. If you give me my health back, then I'll be a better person. Because he couldn't even find out why it was happening to him in the first place. And that's what we have to do. Look at verse 16 through 19. But his explanation was not correct. Uh, talk about Zophar. Look at 16. You will forget your misery. He says, if you do this, if you repent of your sins, Job, you will forget your misery. It will be like water flowing away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Even darkness will be as bright as morning. Having hope will give you courage. You will be protected and will rest in safety. You will lie down unafraid and many will look to you for help. Once again, he said, listen, if you just do this, Job, if you just repent, oh man, God is going to restore all these things to you. He's going to give you back everything you do. So actually, these guys was actually waiting, sitting there with Job, waiting on him to what? Repent. So God can restore him back. That's what they was waiting on. Job just repent. And God will give you back everything you have. Now, if you probably already read the book of Job, you already know that God did bless Job in the last two chapters. He gave him everything, everything double than what he had before. And it wasn't because, because he repented, was it? Job didn't do not one thing that these guys said do. And God, after he explains, we're going to read that explanation when we get there, but after God explains to him what's going on, he blesses Job, not because Job repented, because there was nothing for him to repent of. So watch this. You can't bribe God with your money. So when you hear preachers say, listen, if you give me $25, me, yeah, send it to my ministry. You send it to us, God gonna bless you. That sickness that you had is gonna be gone. I just didn't mean the money. Plus, as a matter of fact, I may give you a good luck coin to put under your pillow. I want you to sleep under with the good luck coin. And I might give you a prayer cloth. I went to Israel myself and got this coin from Israel. It's from Israel. They went to the dollar store right around the corner. That's what they did. Poured the oil right under the tubes and sold it to you for $25. That's what they do, and a lot of people don't even know. But because we think our answer prayer is connected to money, so I'll give up my money for answer prayer. I'm going to go even further than that. Some people think if I pay my tithes, oh my God, I should be all right. Ain't nothing going to happen to me because I faithfully give my tithes to the Lord. Well, show me in the scripture where in the New Testament, you got to show me in the New Testament that it says, if you pay your tithes faithfully, you'll never get sick. Show me that. Show me that scripture. If you give your money to the church, you'll never get robbed. If you give your money to the church, your, your family members, nothing will ever happen to them. Where is that scripture in? It's not in there. So where do we get the idea that my money is my connection to God, so if I give more money, he's going to bless me. I'm not going to get sick. And you can, I'm telling you, you just watch television. Just watch TV and all the radio. 
those television stations, they say it every single time. They call it a seed, right? They say, give your thousand dollar seed. If you give your thousand dollar seed, you will be blessed. If you give your fifty dollar seed, uh, one lady, and I, if I mention her name, you'll know what I'm talking about. She said, if you give her a fifty dollar seed or five hundred dollar seed, she, she will add your name to the book of blessings. I said, isn't that so? I want to see the book of blessings. That's what I want to see. I want to see that book. Because she just hold it up on the TV to let us see it, what the book of blessings is. It's, it's amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing how some of these people are. So guess what? Any type of connection, just like so far, we want this connection with God thinking that if we do something to move God, maybe if I give him more money, he'll heal me. Maybe if I work at the church more days out of the week, he'll bless my business. Maybe, no, it has nothing to do with that at all. God, watch this, blesses you because you are his child, right? And he allows suffering to happen to us because that's his will. Now, when you want to get to heaven and ask him why he allows suffering, you can ask him that when we get to heaven. But this is part of the program. It, it just comes with the territory. If he allowed his son to suffer, if Jesus Christ himself suffered, then why do we think we're going to escape suffering? Why do we think we're going to escape somebody talking about us? Why do we think we're going to escape sickness when Jesus never escaped somebody spitting in his face? Actually beating him on his head with a rod and putting a crown of thorns. They whipped him till he was unrecognizable. And all Jesus had to say was one word and they all would just drop dead just like that. He could have just snapped his finger and they all just disappeared. But he let them do that to him because that was part of the Father's plan. We got to understand and put this in our mind now that suffering, as far as Christianity is concerned, is part of life. This is, this is part of life. And when people are trying to promote this pie in the sky life, when you listen to preachers or your best life now, you can live your best life now, things like that. Uh, no, your best life is not on this planet. Your best life is going to be with Jesus when we get to heaven. You can never live your best life here, ever, ever. You can never live your best because something always going to go wrong. Because Jesus says the, the days of a man that's born of a woman are short and those days are full of trouble. trouble. So how are you going to write a book, your best day is going to be here? No, they're not. You can have your best life now. No, you can't. Even if you go to any, to me, if you go to any resort, you take a trip, you go to Jamaica, you go to Bahamas, you go to these places that you've probably never been before, those places can never compare to what God has in store for you when you get to heaven, right? So, you know, we, we, spend, we spend all this time trying to get to these places, and your situation is still the same. It's just still the same. So here, when these friends are sitting up here trying to down talk Job about some particular sin he did never do, because uh, they try to figure out. In other words, they really trying to get it out of them. That's what they trying to do. They trying to get Job to say what he has done wrong. But listen to some of these. We're gonna look at some of these scriptures. When, when we suffer trouble, we like Job must do what? Trust God. That's, that's key number one. When you suffer trouble, you got to just trust God no matter what. Uh, here's, even when our troubles are terrible, we must continue to praise God. Uh, that's Job chapter 1. Write this down. Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. When Job started hearing those, those guys start coming in with those messages and saying, this is down and you lost this Job, what did he do? He, kept, he praised God. He never gave up. We must be careful that our troubles do not cause us to do evil. Don't get upset so because of your trouble that it caused you to go do something negative. Mm -mm. You got to trust God. Even when we have no food, we should still praise God. Did you know that? Write this down. Habakkuk chapter 3. Verse 17 to 18. That's what it says. Even when you starve, and he says you need to praise God when you ain't got nothing to eat. Uh, it was Jeremiah. He said, Lord, uh, I love, I, he says, I think he said, I, I desire you more than my necessary food. That's what Jeremiah said. But Habakkuk 3, write that down and read that verse that he says we should be so connected with God that even if we're starving, we're supposed to praise God. 
We're supposed to praise him. Uh, he will give us strength to continue to serve him, Habakkuk 3.19. And perhaps even in this world, God will rescue us from some of our troubles. But it, it, there's no scripture in the Bible that he's going to rescue you from every trouble that you may come in your life. It does, there's no promise of that. There is no promise. He blessed Job in the end, but your life not, might not turn out like Job. It might not turn out that way. You, your life might turn out like Paul, like the apostles. They all died. Horrible deaths for the name of Jesus Christ. They, they didn't have million dollar mansions. They didn't have people just throwing money at them. No. They died martyrs. All of those disciples died martyr deaths. You can't say that because Job had a happy ending we, that we're going to get to that your ending may be like Job's. No, we're not saying that at all. We're not saying that Job is the picture of, and don't ever get this lesson out of that Job is the picture of what happens to a Christian when they suffer. No, that's Job's story that God blessed them double. But your story may end that cancer take you out of here. That's your story may end that. His sickness didn't take him out. Your sickness may. That's what we need to understand. That sickness, and sickness is not bad because number one, it's just another door that's going to catapult you to God's kingdom. So you should never look at it as a negative in the first place. Well, if this is the way God wants me to go, this is the way God wants me to go. You know, I think about my wife's, my wife's father, he passed away with cancer, but you know, we had the opportunity to, uh, my wife did minister to him and talk to him and not minister in the sense of salvation, he was already saved, but minister to him and his needs. You know, he would call on us and we would go and help him and go grocery shopping for him. But, you know, he always had an attitude of, because uh, he'd been in church all his life, he always had an attitude of praising God. He always had an attitude of, you know, I know I'm going to go to heaven. He never understood why he had cancer. Now, I'm telling you, you're talking about somebody faithful. This man was a deacon of the church. This man was the right hand man of Pastor Jennings over there at New Providence. And before him, before Pastor Jennings was there, before he was the pastor, he was the right, he was this man right hand man. He was an engineer. So his father and um, uh, Deacon Kellum actually helped them build the church that they had. I mean, he was their right hand man. And so nobody had any bad thing to say about him. But guess what? This man died of cancer. And died slowly. It wasn't quick. So if anybody know anything about sickness, it takes you out of here. You see somebody trying to take breaths and they last breath. And so some people can look at Kellum's life and say, well, why would God allow He must have did something wrong. See, we, we thought Kellum was okay. But see, he must have did something wrong. And like, God paid him back. That's why he's suffering. So no. That's, that's Satan's way of saying, Kellum, give up. Tell him, see, God don't love you. Kill him, go ahead and give up and tell him there is no God because you, you, you're about to leave here out of care. So he never, that wasn't his confession. That wasn't Kellogg's confession. So that shouldn't be our confession. No matter what sickness attack you, no matter what calamity attack you, you should not say, I'm going to give up on God. Did you know, watch this, this happened to Job, you know, for to God bless them, but we know that God is able to help in every situation. When the three Hebrew boys were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, what did they say? O oh, king, remember this? They said, O oh, king, we will not serve you and we will not bow down to your idol gods because we serve a God that can deliver us. Now here's the, here's the point everybody don't like to quote. And even if he don't, that's what they said. Didn't they say that? Even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down to you. Now that's the key we need to understand. Because they get the figure like he could always give me thrown into this fire. That's, they, they already had it in their body. God could allow us to be killed. And guess what? He did throw them in there, but God delivered them. God did deliver them. So we have to have that in mind. Even if death seems likely, God will be with us and he will help us. Uh, God will have a one. Write this down, Daniel. That was Daniel uh, 317. If you want to know about the three Hebrew boys, it said, even if he doesn't. We will not bow down. That's Daniel 3.17.
God will have a wonderful reward for us in heaven. Somebody turn to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. So, see, the reason I don't hear people talking about heaven like they used to, I really don't. I don't hear people preaching about heaven. They don't, they don't preach about the rapture no more. They don't preach about the new heaven and the new earth. Nobody preaches about the 1,000 year kingdom of Jesus Christ. Nobody preaches about that because, see, if the reason that maybe a lot of Christians don't have any hope because they don't even know what to look forward to. We have a lot to look forward to. And if our minds are still wrapped up on this planet, then we don't have nothing to look forward to. So what do we have to look forward to? So I turn to uh, what I say, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, read that for me. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 6 through 8. Those few verses. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, Six, verse. Uh, yeah. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. That's Paul. I have fought a good fight. Yes. I have finished my course. Yes. I have kept the faith. Mm -hmm. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Stop right there. Go back. Henceforth. He, so he says, I'm ready to be offered up. I'm ready to die. Whatever hour God's going to allow me to die. He says, because I fought and I ran the race, right? I kept the faith. But he goes on to talk about what's, what's going to happen to him. But there is something laid up for me. In heaven. What is it? A crown of what? Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only, and not only, I'm sorry, and not to me only, but, not to to, me but unto all them also that love his appearance. So, so not to just him only. He was just talking for himself and personally. I, I won't get a crown. I'm, I'm Paul. I'm the apostle Paul. Give me a crown. He said, no, not just to me, but to all of them that love his appearing. You got something to look forward to. So what is a few days of suffering down here? Amen. What is what is that? What is that compared to eternity of blessing? It's nothing compared to the eternity of blessing. Absolutely nothing. You know, and, and, and I don't know if this happened to you, but it happens to me. That the older I get, doesn't seem like time go faster. <laughs> you know, we're almost a half the year of 2016 already. Yes. It's May. Mm -hmm. This year, I don't even know how fast this year is going by, but it's going by so fast. So time is actually going so fast for us, us older people here. It's just moving fast for us. I don't know about that people. <laughs> but for us, it's moving. <laughs> and we look up, we like, my kids, what? They graduated. They're getting married. They got kids that are on the, of, of themselves. That is fast for us, but we have to understand time is moving, but there's eternity waiting us. And then we got to understand that when we cross over to the other side, we will be blessed. So this few, this this suffering that we go through down here, whatever the trial may be, it could be some trial and tribulation. I think what happens with us, what happened to Christians, was television and watching. We, we got hooked just like the rest of the world with watching celebrities. So we, 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 we think that everybody is driving a Bentley and everybody gets to change their clothes uh, every five seconds. <laughs> everybody gets to work. That's not the average person. Y'all watching the wrong TV shows. The average person do not get to live in a million dollar house, just to let you know that. That's not the average person in this world. The average person don't eat steak every day. The dog, no. The dog. The average person don't have a dog that they can change and polish the dog with nails and get the dog manicures and pedicures. No, <laughs> put them in a little bag and carry them around. No, the average person don't do that. So we gotta understand that that our children have grown up and watched this on television. They watch these shows, the reality shows. They watch these lifestyles of people, their famous singers, and think that these people are actually living this way. They, nine times out of ten, they are not living that way. Half that stuff they written out in the first place. Oh, they're not happy. Yeah, or they're they not happy. And they, they don't even put that together. That okay, with all the money that they got, why are they getting divorced? Right. Or why are they why are they hooked on drugs? Or why are they doing this and why are they doing that? You would think if, they, if the money was your answer, if money was our answer to everything, as a, as a matter of fact, it was a, another preacher by the name of you would know who he is. He said this. He said, the Bible says money answers every problem. He read the uh, 
uh, out of the book of Ecclesiastes, I think it's in there, there's a scripture that says money answers all problems. It is a verse that says that. But see, he didn't read it into context. So if you read it into context, you read the chapter, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, where I went to, to find that statement, it's there, yes, but it was referring to a king who actually thought that his money could solve all problems, right? And he realized, because this preacher on television didn't tell the whole story, he realized it didn't solve all problems. That his problems, he said, wait a minute, I got all this money, but I, I have the same problems as that guy who's making, who's working at McDonald's. I have the same problems he had. How is that? And so my money, and he, because remember the king disguised himself and went out to the people. And he disguised himself, he wanted to see how the people were living. And he realized, okay, he's getting drunk just like I get drunk in a castle. He over here doing all this stuff I'm doing, I'm thinking I'm living large, and the people over here who ain't got nothing still doing the same thing I'm doing. He says, money don't answer, no, I, I realize that I thought money answered all problems, and people who are the poorest people still can find some happiness somewhere, because it's not in the money. And that's what our people need to understand, and a lot of people need to understand, it's not about that. Verse 20, that, uh, let's finish verse, chapter 11, I think that's uh, verse 20 is the last verse. Yeah. For Job, verse 20, he says this, but the wicked will be blinded. They will have no escape. Their only hope is death. Remember, this is so far thinking he's talking to Job about his wickedness. The statement is true, but not to Job is not. Yeah, the, the, the wicked will be blinded, and the wicked will have no escape, and their only hope is death. But that does not refer to Job. And he actually, I try to attribute this verse to Job. And Job probably looked at him, he's going to find out next week how Job really answered them. And he's going to answer each accusation about being guilty, about being not innocent, and about not having any hope. Any questions about Zophar's statement? To Job. So right now, just, just put this all in perspective. We already heard from three, we already heard from his three friends. That's just their first speech. So after Job answers them in chapter 12, 13, 14, they're going to begin to go to their second speech. They're not going to get tired of talking to him. They're going to talk again. I think they got, I think each one of them got three speeches. Maybe it's 42 chapters in here. <laughs> each one has three speeches. So we just finished. The first set of three speeches, but Job has to answer this one, and after which, as we're going to take us to chapter 14, chapter 15, uh, Eliphaz, he begins his second speech. So you would think they would have learned out of the first three replies from Job, how Job felt, and Job did not not feel that he sinned against God, but they didn't finish there. They're going to keep going, keep pulling at him. And that's just like the devil. He's going to do that to you. You know that? He's going to nag at you and nag at you until he gets you to fall for his trap. Job is not going to fall for their accusations. People can really nag at you. You know that, don't you? you know, if, if the police can try to nag at people, Right? To get them to confess. Oh, I confess. What you want me to sign? Let me just sign. Y'all getting on my nerves. I'm going to sign this. You just admitted that you done stole because <laughs> they put that pressure on you. Satan does that to us. He'll use people to do that to you. Yes, he will. They get on your nerves so if someone says, you can make me cuss. <laughs> well, Satan can allow folks to, uh, to irritate you so, and that's what he wants you to do. To let your guard down and go there with other people and fall and get, get on that level. And he, he just laughed all the way through, laughing all the way. Said, look, he let, he let you fall and you fell for it. We shouldn't fall for it. So next week, let's begin uh, talking about Job answering those three accusations. Any other questions about Zophar's, his statement? So we already know that each one of these guys were wrong, all three of them. Zophar was the youngest, but he was still wrong. And we saw the reason why he was wrong. So we're going to go a little further. No other questions. All right. Let's bow our heads forward and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to understand your scripture tonight. Thank you for these, your children who are here as we prepare to discuss from this place. But we ask that we will place this word in our hearts. We now have a better picture 
of understanding where suffering comes from. And each and every day as we study this, each and every week, we get stronger and stronger into the reality that heaven is real and that suffering is just as real as heaven, but it can't keep us and separate us from the love of Christ no matter what Satan throws our way. And Heavenly Father, we understand now that we're going to receive accusations from other people as well. We're going to receive attacks from Satan as well. But we will say what Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him as we dismiss from this place. We ask that your will be done in our lives, that as we travel these streets and highways, that we go to our homes and find everything in order. In Jesus' name, amen.